Can I ask you to welcome one of Scotland's most successful business people, Jim McCall. Thanks, Jim. Uh, th thank you, Stuart. Um, and Stuart ran through my, my early um, career uh, joining Weirs as an apprentice. Uh, I'd just like to take you through once I bought into Weir Pumps, um, how I then, uh, sorry, once I bought into Clyde Blowers after going through all of this, how I have then developed the company, moving on and spending a bit more time to our latest acquisition, which is the Ferguson Shipyard in, in Port Glasgow, and then talk a bit about uh, a junior college, uh, a school for 14 to 16 year olds that we've started and tell you a bit about that. I bought into Clyde Blows in 92. Many of you have heard this story. I'll go through it quickly, but I'm told some are here who haven't. Um, and the, the main goal I had as, an, as a, a consultant was to build enough capital to buy into a company. Um, I didn't come from a background where there was a lot of wealth in the family, so I had to create this uh, and find creative ways and innovative ways to raise it myself. So I took a small fee when I was working as an independent consultant and a share of the upside, confident that I could make enough from the upside in businesses that I went into to, to raise enough capital to buy into a company. So I bought into uh, Clyde Blowers in 1992. And during the 90s, we, it, was, it was the smallest of eight doing what it did. And between 92 and 97, we bought seven of the eight. So we ended up with 60% share of the world market, started with three, and we had businesses um, all over the, the, the world. We had them in Russia, China, India, America, uh, Europe. We, we globalized the business. It was a traditional or a, a consolidation exercise, something that you learn at business school and um, when I left business school, I thought all you had to do was go out there and do it, and that's what I did. Um, I didn't think at the time of some of the, the challenges. It was about setting the goal, setting the vision, and then working out what you needed to do to achieve it. And that's been the, the theme with all of the businesses we go into. We do a lot of background studying of the market. We really try to understand the market we're in, identify the opportunities. Very often, the companies that we're in or buy into, have got very small market shares. We decide what market share we want to get, target it, and then work out what we need to do to get there. And it's basically as simple as that. You've just got to take the actions to, to get you to the vision and keep coming back and checking that you're on the right path. If you're not, change it and get onto the right path and you eventually get there. At the end of the 90s, we took the company private. It had been listed. And we then went on to a model where we were building up individual companies. Uh, I had this, this vision to build up uh, between six and eight companies at different stages um, of development. So we'd buy into one that needed uh, growing or had an opportunity to grow and create value, take it through a cycle of maybe six, seven years, and then exit it, either refinance it in some other way, or list it, or exit the company and bring in another one at the beginning, I thought we could have a pipeline of about six or eight, and every year there would be a nice liquidity event, giving us a good capital gain to invest in the next challenge. That didn't work because we had, we were investing myself and three of my partners were investing our own money. Um, and we had to have co-investors. We didn't have enough to buy six or seven companies at different stages. We had to have co-investors and we took different co-investors into each business. Uh, that became a problem because each one wanted 100% of our time on their business, the business they were invested in, and they didn't want us dissipating that time in other businesses. Now, up to a maximum of three, I was able to convince them that they were getting a significant amount of our time and the majority of our time we worked long hours, we worked hard, and we, we, we were able to give a good input to those three different investors. But I couldn't take it beyond that. So I started to look at a model that would allow me to get up to between six and eight and would align our interests with our investors. And that model was a private equity model, a typical uh, private equity model. So we set about in the early 2000s raising a fund 
trying to raise a, a private equity fund. Now that was taking a lot longer than I thought it would. Um, when you raise money, people are giving you a lot of money. We raised a fund of 250 million eventually. But people give you that money and they're trusting you to invest it properly. The only comeback they have is if you don't do it, they won't give you any more. So they do a lot of diligence. They go through your, your bins, they put private detectives on you, they go and interview people that you've sacked five years before and ask them what they think, what they think about you. And it's, um, it's really quite a thorough, in-depth um, examination they do before you get this money. In the, in the interim, um, Weir pumps became available for sale. And when I was here speaking last time, it was in 2011, and we had just made the acquisition. And that company um, was about to be closed down. Sulzer had entered into an agreement to buy it. They were going to close the factory, move the main jobs to Leeds. And that was 550 employees. It, it was a, a company that I had a very warm affiliation with and, and a concern to many of our investors was that this was an emotional decision to invest in it and not, that was my three fellow investors, an, an emotional decision and not a commercial one. However, um, we, we did manage to, to buy the company. Um, we saved the 550 jobs. The factory had been sold to Cala to build 500 odd homes. We managed to get the factory back. I had approached Cala um, to ask them what sort of profit they get out of building 550 homes and how long it takes. And then I was going to offer them the profit discounted uh, and try and buy the factory back. Now, at first, those, those discussions were tough, but then the banking crisis came along and it made it easier to talk to them, and we got the factory <laughs> back. But when I bought this business, when I think back, we bought a business that was in a huge factory, 17 acres, heavy machinery, and I had to get out of it 18 months later. I just knew we would find somewhere. I didn't know where. I just had a, a firm belief that we had good people. It was a great company, and we'd find somewhere and some way to do it. And, and it all worked out uh, favourably, um, helped by the banking crisis. But this, um, so we got the factory back. We had 550 people. And between uh, 2007 and 2008, uh, myself and three of my partners were funding this. We bought the business for 48 million. We were identifying potential acquisitions to grow it because I believed that it needed to grow globally. It was based in Glasgow and most of the activities were there. But it had to be manufacturing in places like China, India, America. It had to be global. So we started that exercise. Meanwhile, we're still trying to raise our fund. Um, and we eventually got that raised in 2008, uh, three days before Lehman Brothers collapsed. That allowed us to then go forward and start the acquisition process. So from 2008 to 2011, we built this up to eight manufacturing plants, 27 service centres worldwide, and we increased the number of employees at Cathcart from 550 to 960. We then sold the business in 2011, four years after I'd bought Weir Pumps and three years after we had raised the fund. We also had bought another company completely separate in, in Switzerland and we sold that one as well. And from those two sales, we paid back all of the original investment um, to our investors. Now that was um, a huge surprise to our fund investors because over that period, most of them were writing down the investments they had in private equity because of the banking crisis. We sold that for uh, just about £500 million, having invested a further 40. So we had invested about 88, 90 million, and we sold it for 500. That allowed us to pay back all of the initial investment we had. It also allowed us to go out and raise our next fund, which was uh, a £420 million fund. It started out being 400 million cap, um, but we had to raise it because we were twice oversubscribed for this fund because of the, the success. It's a small community, the private equity investors. Word goes round, if you've got a successful fund, uh, they all get to know about it very quickly. 
and we couldn't take all the money that we were offered. So we had to scale it back, but there were some key investors we did want in. So that's why we had to raise the fund a little bit and take in 420. Now, in exiting the weir pumps business, that was difficult to do. But we had a fund, we had investors in that business that we had to give a return to. And I felt that I was maybe betraying the, the employees because they had really done a great job for us in there. And I had been speaking to them when we took it over very regularly. So I thought I would get them all together um, in the halls just up from the factory and tell them about the sale and explain who the buyers were and why we'd done it. And I did expect to get heckled, but I thought it was the least I could do was stand up there and, and talk to them. And I was really very surprised with the outcome. They asked if I couldn't stay on with the new employers, could I stay on part time, and then some people coming up at the end in tears, thanking me for what we'd done. So it was something that I was dreading getting into. And I was absolutely surprised when I came out of there. Um, the business is still employing way more than it was when we, when we bought it and saved it. It's cut back a bit from the 960 because it's a large American corporation that moved some of the jobs. But they, they are still well above the 550 that were there. And we've got a very good, iconic engineering business that's still here in Glasgow, providing very high quality jobs to, to Glaswegians. Um, we raised our fund four, uh, our fund three, sorry, the, the first one we called fund two because people don't like investing in fund one, so we <laughs> called it fund two. Um, and fund three, which was the second one, in 400, 420 million, we raised in 2012. Uh, now that's 72% invested just now. We've got seven portfolio companies in there and we've got some add-on acquisitions that we need to do that will take up the whole fund. Very good returns coming through in some of the businesses. And the last acquisition we made there was Ferguson, which was a strange one for some of our investors because it didn't really quite fit our criteria that we had outlined, but we managed to bend the criteria to make it fit. This was a a business that went into administration about six months ago and it was the last commercial shipyard in the Clyde and we all know the history of the Clyde, the proud history of, of shipbuilding in the Clyde and I thought it was criminal that they should just disappear. The company was um, fairly, you know, heavily underinvested. It, it, it didn't really have any work. It stopped taking orders for ferries and ships and it done that against competition from uh, overseas, from Poland, Germany, Turkey, because it couldn't compete. And the reason it couldn't compete was not because they couldn't, uh, they couldn't do a good commercial job or a good build a good quality ship. They have fantastic skills there, great skills. Um, and they can, they can build a really, a really nice ship. Um, so, you know, it, it, was, it was key for me to try and do something there. The, re the ma main reason that they were failing was that when you go to build a ship, you have to put up a, a bank guarantee, a bond, and that can be up to 90% of the value. Now, Polish yards and German yards are getting help from their local their governments to do that. They're getting guarantees from the government to back the bond, the bank guarantee. Uh, we don't have that here. Now, we. We do have uh, export credit guarantees and, and we were the first to get one of those in Weir's because whilst I was in Weir Pumps, I was asked to go on a trade mission with um, David Cameron to, uh, to China and I was asked to write, uh, I, had, I had three questions I had to answer. The first one was easy, it was, um, you know, what will you get out of the trip, uh, going on this trip with the Prime Minister and the Business Secretary? And, you know, that's all the good, uh, the credibility for your company and all the good things you can say there. Uh, the second question was easy. That was, will you have any 
orders to announce when you're there so that the Prime Minister can be seen signing them or the Business Secretary can be seen signing them and we had, we had a few of those as well. And the third question was a difficult one. That was what, what questions would you have of the Prime Minister or the Business Secretary on the trip? And I, I wrote two pages to them and I thought that would just knock me out of getting on the trip. But surprisingly, I was asked on. Now, the, 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 the crux of that letter was that I thought it was great what the government were doing. They'd, they'd already been to India and were now going to China to drum up business for UK companies. But I said it was, it was unfortunate that the UK companies couldn't take up that opportunity because when you do these big contracts overseas, you have to put up bank guarantees. And at that time, the banks were in real turmoil. They were pulling back from giving bank guarantees. It used to be, it's a contingent obligation. It's not real debt, but it was now being treated as core debt. So when you went into the, the ceiling you had in the amount of debt, you could get a multiple of your earnings. It was capped way below where it was before and where, where it needed to be to give these guarantees. Um, the French government were guaranteeing them. We, ha we had had to move some work from Cathcart over to France to get the contracts because we had run out of headroom for our guarantees with the bank. Um, and we had also moved one to Canada where the, in France they guarantee 80% of these bonds and in Canada they guarantee 100% of them. So there's no risk to the banks or very little in France. Um, and that, that wasn't available in the UK. When we came back from the trip, I was impressed because Export Credit Guarantee came on to me and said that Number 10 had been on and asked them to put in place trade finance and to speak to me to get the details of what they needed to do. And they were told to get it in place um, within six months. Now, it took them longer than six months, but they got it in place and we get the first a government-backed bank guarantee for a big project we had in China from Weir Pumps. Now that's for exports. If, if someone locally here is, is ordering a ship, we're at a disadvantage because you can't, it's not an export and we've got to put up a big guarantee. If Polish company are doing it, they're getting guarantees behind it. If a German company is doing it, it's the same. If the Turks are doing it, it's the same. So we're at a huge disadvantage. It won't stop us, we'll find a way. We found a way with the, the first ship and we'll find a way. We're currently um, bidding for 200 metre ferries just now. We hope to hear about it at the end of this month. Um, but you know, the, the, the yard, I think, um, was a fantastic opportunity to rebuild and, and have the rebirth of commercial shipbuilding in the Clyde. We immediately took on uh, the 70 individuals that were made redundant. We took 35 on Im immediately. We didn't have any work, but we took them on and put them to work, uh, just doing repairs, tidying up the yard. Um, the other 35 had had payment in lieu of notice, so we scheduled their recruitment uh, in line with when they would run out of their payment so that they were not financially damaged by being put in, uh, put in redundancy. And we took all 70 back. Um, we got our first ship because they, there had been a tender put out by the yard for four hybrid ferries. They'd already built two. There were two remaining. And um, the, the, the uh, Caledonia McBrain or Caledonian um, maritime assets were about to place the order for the third of those and thought they couldn't place it with Ferguson, who had already won the bid um, for the four, although um, you know they were staged out over a period of time. So we, we got that order, we're currently building it, it was good, it was up there last week and we've already got the first sections out in the slipway, um, I've already been in interfering with the way they build them, I think, <laughs> um, and, and I'm sure uh, we're, we're going to make... Uh, be, be able to make a slight profit out off of building this one because we're investing, we're, we're lining up quite a bit of investment in that yard. We'll, we put aside four million when we bought the company. It cost us about half of that to buy it from the administrator. The other two was for funding 
immediate losses in working capital, and we've got about three or four million that we're just about to invest um, in upgrading the yard. We're building new offices, we're knocking down all the old ones, we're putting in new cranes, we're improving the manufacturing setup, and we're bidding for two new ferries. Um, the workforce are fantastic. You know, we, I get asked when I'm going to, I just come in from Amsterdam this morning and I was asked yesterday about um, unions on the Clyde having a bad name. I said, look, these guys are the best workers you'll get. They were traveling, a lot of them were traveling from that part of the world down to Rosyth for the building of these two big aircraft carriers. And the word I got from the, the chief executive of Babcock sitting next to him at a dinner one night was that the quality of work that these guys were doing was way above the other labour that he had to bring in from Poland and overseas. And um, the skills are fantastic and we shouldn't lose them. And I'm really glad that we've now been able to get the opportunity to put them to work again. We're bidding uh, for the two 100 metre ferries. Now that's on the limit of what they build up there. These are big vessels. Um, we've already been looking at facilities in Renfrew to back the fabrication up so that we will sail fabricated parts down the river, down to the yard to be put together because it, this would be quite a workload. With the existing ferry, we're going to have to increase the workforce to about 120 from the 70 we have just now. Well, we've got 80 now because we've taken on um, a senior team. We've taken on uh, top naval architects. Now, naval architects, uh, you would think are essential in the shipyard. They didn't have one. Um, they outsourced it. So we've taken on naval architects, project managers, or, or directors, sen a senior team. Now, I know the mumblings in the shop floor as is just now is um, they're just filling <laughs> filling that these offices with fat cats. Now we've <laughs> we've got to get that team in place to be able to win these big contracts and and to manage what will be a bigger company. Um, we immediately in taking these people on also gave them a five percent pay increase because I felt they were underpaid. Um, they were ten percent below what they were paying in BAE systems and Babcock. Now, we couldn't go the full way all at once, but we gave them a 5% increase, and we've got a, f we've got a workforce that are absolutely <coughs> fantastic and excited about the opportunities going forward. Um, so we've got a clear vision for that business. We've been inundated with inquiries for ships. You wouldn't believe the demand. And, and it's for, you know, the specialist ones is where we're going to be focusing our attention. Even in the in the oil and gas industry, you know, you've, we've heard about the the um, the cutbacks in Aberdeen because of the, the the oil price going down. We're currently working on a project with uh, someone who deploys ROVs, these subsea robots, to inspect subsea work and also to carry out repairs. Now these inspections have to keep going. It doesn't matter what the price of oil is. To deploy these just now, they use a vessel which costs 150,000 a day. Um, this company has come up with a design of a vessel that can deploy those that they can charge 50,000 a day for. Now those are the kind of savings that are going to make sense in the North Sea and people are going to be focused on. So even although you hear about the downturn in the industry, there are opportunities and there's an abundance of them um, in 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 the shipping area. We just have to work out how to make a profit doing it. You know, if the Poles and the Germans and the Turks can make a profit, we can do it. We just have to work out what we need to do. I haven't worked that out yet, but mm -hmm. we will we'll get there and, and we'll be able to build this over the next few years into a very high class um, shipbuilding company. Now the the business, that's the last acquisition that we'll make in our current fund. So we're currently out raising our next fund, which will be 500 million. Again, we'll invest in uh, six to eight companies in that fund, and we'll take them, globalize them. We'll look for three characteristics in businesses that we buy. One, that it's a mission critical product in a bigger, uh, a bigger process. And it's got to be in oil and gas, power, water, wastewater, um, chemicals, petrochemicals, and mineral, minerals and mining. Um, 
Now I've managed to put the shipbuilding into the oil and gas industry because they supply vessels to service it and um, re renewables as well, so that's the power industry. So I was able to make it fit. It's, it's certainly a critical, a critical um, product. The second criteria we look for is a recurring revenue stream from spare parts and services once our products are in. And then the third opportunity is to globalise business, to buy a business that's uh, either had a very strong past that we can revive and, and then globalise it, or one that's got a very strong regional presence that could be taken out into other regions. And, and that formula has worked very well for us. Um, we should have the first close on our 500 million fund by uh, the fourth quarter of this year and we will be looking to make our first what we call platform acquisition in that by that time. Um, if there are opportunities in Scotland, we're happy to do it. Um, but we do look for opportunities mainly in Europe and America and then build them out from there. If it's an American business, We'll build it out in Europe, the Far East and, and South America, emerging countries. Um, or if it's based in Europe, we'll, we do the same. We're, we, we don't care whether it's the US or Europe. Um, in Scotland just now, we have probably about 300 employees at the moment. But we, we will be able to increase the yard. If we win these two ferries, we'll be up to 400 employees there. And these will be good high paid jobs. Uh, so we need to win those two, uh, those two ferries and we're working hard to, to do that. That will be announced at the end of March, I believe. Uh, we're up against competition from Poland, <coughs> Germany, Turkey, um, and they've got some advantages that we don't, but we'll find a way, uh, we'll find a way around that. Um, so we've got our team in East Kilbride who are basically the the smart guys that manage all of these investments and also we've got an operation, operational team that goes in. We've got finance people and operating people who we can put in to help work with the strategy, work with the management team in the strategy and develop the growth plan and the vision. Um, we've got about 40 people there. Um, we've got Ferguson's where at the moment we've got 80. I hope that's going to go up to 400 over the next few years. Um, Clyde Bergman we have in, in uh, the east of Glasgow and I think you've got about 60 now, have you? Um, that, that's the original Clyde Blowers that we bought. We moved it from Clyde Bank to Bridgeton uh, and that, that business is, is really doing very well and very, very well managed by one of our uh, top CEOs over here. Um, we've got Parsons Peebles that we bought in Rosyth. Now that, that was a company that in its peak employed 2,000 based in Edinburgh and over the years it just went down and down. We've got about 60 in there just now but again building that up. We bought it two years ago and um, we've invested quite a bit in the factory at Rosyth. We've bought, we've made one acquisition down south. We're about to make a second one down south and one in America and we're looking at a very large acquisition <laughs> for it in the Czech Republic. Um, that's going to rebuild that Parsons Peebles brand, which was, it's, it's an old iconic brand. Many of you, may, it maybe doesn't mean a lot to you, but uh, from my background as an engineer and working in Weirs, I saw it in every power plant I went into. It was a shame to see it die or almost die. And we managed to, uh, to recover that one as well. And we've been looking at two acquisitions just now, one in Dundee and one in Aberdeen. I'd now like to just move on to something else that we've been focused on probably for about four or five years now, and that's um, Newlands Junior College, where we are looking to engage with 14 to 16-year-olds who are in schools within the catchment area of where we have the college. Now, where we have the college, it's the old apprentice training department, and it's a building that was separate at Weir's. And when we had that business in 2007, I had identified this building as one that we would use for training young, young people. That's where I spent the first year of my off-the-job training uh, as an apprentice when I was 16. Now that all, all of that type of activity gets outsourced, there was a very good infrastructure at the time with, um, you know, Rolls-Royce, Weir's, 
would take on hundreds of apprentices and there was a very good uh, college infrastructure on City and Guilds, so NC, HNC, leading through to university if you wanted. That's the path that I went with them. Also positive reinforcement from people that you were working with and the, the, the leaders in the apprentice training. I remember my first day being told the sky was the limit and I believed it, <laughs> which led to buying the business. But uh, you know, that very, very strong encouragement and being told that if you work hard, we'll support you, but you have to do your bit. And I thought we needed to put something in place to the community down there and, and to the greater community in the south side of Glasgow. Um, and, and look at this, this school. Now, this was, this, the idea here is, is to be part of the education system. You know, you hear about co schools down south being set up by rich individuals who take them away from the council. That's not the issue. That's not going to work in Scotland. You need to work within the education system here. We've got a very good education system in Scotland and it looks after most of the pupils that we have very well. But there are, there's a small group at the bottom, and when I say at the bottom, I don't mean that in a, a negative way. People who really could be doing, you know, I've, I've tried to find a nice way to define them because there's lots of labels these kids get that are negative, and it's terrible to see it in the press or have them referred to as, you know, coming from a poor background or or, you know, been part of um, in work poverty, a family that's... I, I didn't realise that I grew up in a family that would be badged now as uh, being suffering from in work poverty. I didn't know at the time. But we've now got these badges now and they're negative and they contaminate people's minds. So, you know, we've tried to find ways to identify this group. It's probably a group of about 10, 10% who don't engage or disengage with the education system because it's not, that it doesn't suit them. You know, we moved 50 years, we've been trying to fix this. We moved to comprehensive education. The problem was we didn't move, it wasn't comprehensive because it missed out on people who did better by doing vocational type work. Um, and it tried to put them in, fit them all into an academic abstract type of um, teaching environment and that, that helped a lot of people moving into that comprehensive education but there's still a group there that disengaged because the for whatever reason um, I, I've, I heard a good phrase here it said because um, focus on those whose grades hadn't yet revealed their potential because I believe all these kids have got potential we just haven't been able to find a way to, to focus on them. So we, we've identified, um, and it was really the head teachers of schools around Glasgow in a number of meetings we had that said, look, at 14, we see some of them disengaging for whatever reason. They disengage, they switch off, they're just waiting until they become 16 to leave. They just want to leave. Now, these people would probably leave without any qualifications or very low qualifications. And you know, there's, there's, there's very good research that shows there's a, a very good correlation, almost perfect correlation, between having no qualifications and ending up in what they call either in work poverty or unemployed and in welfare. And that's because they haven't been engaged properly. Now we've, we've set up this school to give them maths, English, arithmetic and IT. Those are the four cores. They still need those core subjects and they need sometimes one-to-one -one attention to help them in that. We also provide nine vocational courses, eight of them delivered by City of Glasgow College and, and Paul Little who's sitting here has been a fantastic help in setting those up so that we can send the kids to do a choice of they can choose three vocational courses uh, each year. We've got them for S3 and S4 and that's, that's going down a treat. I just had a, we had an email from 
one of your lecturers, Paul, I don't know if you saw it, on um, creative digital media. And uh, he said they were a dream to work with the kids. They're just so engaged because they're, 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 they're able to get excited about what they're doing. Um, and there, there's a whole range of subjects they can choose from. And then in addition to that, we also have life skills. We've got skill force in working with us. We've got a full-time skill force employee. And that teaches them, you know, the discipline, I suppose, and life skills. I mean, simple things. Every week we have a, a posters up on a different, a different issue. Just simple things, like last week I think it was, remember eye contact's important. So everybody, when they're walking about in the school that day, you've got to get eye contact. And you'll know when you're dealing with 14 to 16 year olds, quite often you don't get a lot of eye contact. You know, it's looking down and mumbling. Um, so simple things like that, we're taking them outward bound to Loch Eel, half of them in March. Just, you know, getting them involved in sport. They made a film on drugs, uh, you know, to, to show how you can get dragged into it. And it was fantastic. Um, they're just so animated. If you had seen these kids when they come in, we've had them on, this is the first year. We pick them up in the morning um, from wherever they are. We provide the transport. We give them breakfast and we give them lunch. We take them to college and bring them back and we take them to any of their, their outside activities. We've given them all uh, an iPad, warned them they're not allowed to sell it and we've, ba we've, <laughs> we've, we've blocked off any porno sites or anything like that. You know, we've, we've had the IT people look at it and we've got the latest technology in the school and I would invite any of you to just pop in and see it. It's open to go in any time. You'll probably find some of the students will run to meet you and tell you about it. We have traditional classrooms, but we have breakout areas as well. Booths they can go into, tables they can sit at, we've got the canteen. And when they're doing work in the classroom, after the instruction, we allow them to wander about, go and line a bean bag, go in wherever, but they're doing their work, they're doing it. And, and we're using technology, they're using their iPads. We've got Apple TV in there. Um, it's an amazing environment and you know, I would encourage you to go and see it. We've had a lot of help from um, many companies. This is, a, this is a partnership between the Scottish Government, Glasgow City Council and industry and the further education colleges. And it's very important that all those parties are fully engaged because it wouldn't work otherwise. And we've got you know, a, a lot of... Um, Schools engaged just now. We, we had close to our area, we reckoned, 11 schools that were within the catchment area. Now we've got pupils at our college, and I call it a college, it's a junior college because I didn't want it to be a special school. It's back to using the right terminology. It's not a special school. This is a college. They're moving on from school and they're going to a junior college in a step, hopefully, towards college. We also guarantee them all an apprenticeship, not an interview, an apprenticeship. And our backers have all signed up to guarantee it, apprenticeships. And we've also guaranteed them a college place. The courses that they're doing at college, at college will align them to go on to other courses to get an NC, an HNC, and then on to university if they wish. Um, and there's a very good, in particularly in engineering, there's a very good course at uh, working with City of Glasgow College and Strathclyde University just now. I was long at a graduation recently and the facilities are fantastic and you see the new buildings going up. We've got <coughs> fabulous resources here and I think we need everybody to engage, um, all the members of the community to engage to make sure that we make the best use of these and I think we are doing a good job there. It's the first year, we've still got our cynics. <laughs> um, but they'll see, It'll, uh, you know, it's going to work out very well. And I think, you know, we can have a number of these in, in amongst a, a group of schools. And it can be a resource to local schools. We've got pupils from Castle Milk High, Govan, Govan High, Hill Park, Holyrood, Ross Hall, St Paul's High and Shawlands Academy. And 
at the moment, Lourdes uh, are nominating someone to come along as well. We've got 25 students just now. We can take 30. Uh, we have three schools that have not nominated anyone. Bella Houston, Kings Park and St Margaret Mary's. Um, my finance director at, uh, at, um, in Clyde Bloors, he went to Kings Park and he tried to arrange to see the headmistress to tell her, look, this might be something worthwhile doing. Wouldn't see him. Uh, some people just don't think that it's the right thing. And what we have to do, I think, and, and I think it's with the best, these, ki these people are in charge of these children and they're, 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 they're sceptical about it. And, and rightly so, probably, but, you know, they can come along and see it <laughs> and, and they'll see the environment they're in. It's fantastic. We've also, you know, I've mentioned uh, Paul Little from, uh, from City of Glasgow College. I mean, the facilities there are just fantastic and what Paul has done is unusual for the public sector or, or the education sector. It's an entrepreneurial step he's taken. Um, and the facilities that we've been provided there are just fantastic. The, the, the young people love it and they're blossoming. Now, we, we, we had no problem getting industrial support for this. We've got the Weir Group were one of the first there. We've got SPX who bought over Weir Pumps. We've got Scottish Power, Scottish Gas, Arnold Clark, William Grant, Allied Vehicles, Dundas and Wilson, Brian Souter, Petroleum Expert, which is Hamid Goodrod. I know Hamid's first name well, but I have difficulty with his second one. <laughs> Big supporter. Hamid wants to do one in Edinburgh, but he's working with us to get the model going, the template right, and he'll do it in Edinburgh. Um, we've got SCF, Scottish Government, Glasgow City Council, Sterling Foods, PRG Recruitment, and I've probably missed out a whole load more. People are very keen to help young people here. There's a, there's a real enthusiasm to help young people. And this whole thing is, is, is really a fantastic success. You know, the, the kids, you must come along and see it because you, you can't explain the energy and the, the difference here. And one thing that um, at the beginning when they were all kind of quiet and the, they're a bit apprehensive, you know, they've asked, we've had some of these representatives from these businesses along and one of the kids asked them, why are you interested in helping us? You know, a simple question and, and he, he, was, he had to think for a while, but everybody's keen to help these kids. In fact, I think we can do this you know, around Glasgow. We're working on this one on the south side. Um, we may do something on the north side. We've got a couple of young people from the north side that we pick up because one of the social workers who, who is working with one of our young people said, you really need to go and see this place. And she came and begged us to take a couple of people from the north, so we did it. There was a person from William Wood, which is East Renfrewshire, come on. And we said, okay, we'll take them. And we've had an approach to see if we can give half a dozen places to North Lanarkshire, to schools in Motherwell. So there's demand. We will probably do something out in Port Glasgow and we may look to do another, lead another one in, in the north of Glasgow and perhaps the east end of Glasgow. I think this is a model that fits in very well and complement, complements everything else that's going on. This, the, the recent report by Ian Wood is a big step forward because it allows people in third, fourth and fifth year to be able to choose vocational courses at the colleges and, and there's a seven year rollout plan in place there for that to happen. But it's important we don't miss these people who will end up in, in this poverty trap or this inward poverty trap. And there's no need for them to be there. These, we've got 25 really talented young individuals. We're working on them to develop their talent and they're going to be successful out there. And just as a final comment, you know, when they come in at first, they, they're all into the social media and so on. And someone posted on it um, something which I thought was, was um, surprising to come from this group of young people. They tried to bury us, but they didn't realise we were seeds. Absolutely amazing. Um, you know, it's, it's so rewarding to, uh, <coughs> to see these young people, how they come on. And um, we're still looking for some help. 
um, to sponsor them or because we have to do a second year next year and that proves the whole cycle and we'll get them into work and we'll get them to college and then I think we can roll it out. Places like Dundee, we've had interest from uh, DC Thompson and Dundee. Uh, we've had interest in Aberdeen. Uh, you know, there are, there are other spots around, uh, in fact, all over Scotland where this kind of initiative as part integrated into the, 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 the education system, I think can really make a big change to this whole uh, trap that people get in in poverty and in particular in work poverty. So thanks very much. Mm -hmm.